What is going on, everyone? Anthony Drew Gary here, host of the How To Show, where we talk about optimizing life, money, and happiness one how to at a time. I have created a bunch of videos now on different ways to save for retirement and different strategies, tips, tricks, those sorts of things. And all of them have premised around the concept of how to save for retirement when you either work a W-2 job or you work for someone else. And in doing that, I've realized that I've left a slice of the American economy out of the discussion, and that's basically people who work for themselves in some capacity. Either you run a business or you're self-employed or you're part of the gig economy. And I wanna spend some time talking about retirement when you work for yourself. And to best do that, I'm gonna bring on a guest for this episode of the show. I wanna make sure that I'm leaving no stone unturned, and so it's important for me to reach out to experts when necessary. And so this week on the show, I'm going to have Alicia Dion join me. She is a writer and a vlogger. She has a YouTube channel as well. You can find her at Alicia Dion, friend of finance, but you'll check that out later on. For now, we'll check in with Alicia and we'll jump into the show. Alicia, welcome to the How To Show. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for having me. You betcha. So today we're going to talk about how to save for retirement when you're self-employed. And this is a topic I don't know a whole lot about. So that's why I'm leaning on you to really drive the different options that are there. In your experience, what have you seen that, uh, that maybe self-employed folks have as, uh, as a tool in their toolkit to work for, toward retirement? So before being self-employed myself, the last um, year and a half or so, this is something that really inspired me because learning about retirement and learning how important 401ks are and 403bs are and these plans that are set up by an employer and then becoming self-employed, it's like, okay, you don't have access to those plans anymore. And a lot of people, I think, just don't save for retirement because of that. So to answer your question, there definitely are tools available for self-employed people. I think the first and most simple way to save for retirement when you don't have those plans is just with a traditional or a Roth IRA, which you don't need to be self-employed to do, but that's kind of like the easy stepping stone. But when you are self-employed, you do have access to even more retirement accounts. So I personally like the SEP IRA, which is you know, similar to a traditional IRA, but you need to be self-employed to open it. And it has a much higher contribution limit. So you can put in more than just the $6,000 that you would be putting in a traditional IRA. And then there's also the solo 401k option. Interesting. So we'll talk a little bit more about those enhanced contribution limits. But when you set up one of these SEP IRAs, who's eligible for that? You you know, there there are different levels of of self-employed. And I think that there might be a a stigma with the the term self-employed that it could be scary. Maybe I don't want to identify as self-employed, but in reality, if I'm, if I'm doing something like a side hustle or something like that, how, how self-employed do you have to be to be considered self-employed? I guess is what I'm asking. Basically any income that you are earning that is not reported on a W-2 at the end of the year. So if you have a side hustle where you are, you know, making money on a 1099, or if you're just like, you know, bringing money in from your own side hustle, that is definitely step you're, you're able to contribute to a step IRA with that money. The kind of requirements to show legitimacy, I guess, would be a lot of SEP IRAs do require that your contribution comes from a business checking account rather than just a personal checking account. I know some places if you're a sole proprietor, so if you're self-employed and not set up as an LLC, then you can use a personal checking account, but that's not everywhere. And I will also add that you should have an EIN, which is an employee identification number, So as individuals, we all have our social security number if you're in the US and businesses have an EIN. Now you can get an EIN for absolutely free from the IRS's website and you get that number and that's what you would open your SEP IRA with. So that's basically the thing. You need an EIN and you should have a business checking account. 
Gotcha. And, and it sounds like some of these, you know, bare minimum requirements are just founded in good accounting principles. If you've got yourself a, uh, a side hustle or a side business or just some sort of a business, having a checking account dedicated to that probably makes sense anyway. So it starts to to inform good financial decisions anyway. So that that's good. That's good information. I thank you for touching on the EIN. I'll mm -hmm. link in the show notes down below to, to how to get an EIN. Uh, there's a, a link to the IRS website. I've done it personally and Alicia is yep. absolutely right. Uh, it was free and it didn't take a whole lot of time. So to continue to talk about that, we've talked about, you know, side hustlers and we've talked about independent contractors. Am I accurately describing that when I think the gig economy, like people who maybe drive for Uber, they deliver on DoorDash or anything in that capacity, these, these folks count, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say like, it's almost more important when you're doing that because you know, when your income is coming from all of these different places and you don't have the security or you might be doing that alongside a traditional job with the W-2, but you know, it's just more important to be saving some of that money for your future. And especially when you look at the taxes that are owed when you're self-employed, you're paying more in taxes. So when you're making these SEP IRA contributions, you're making your tax income smaller. So you're making the amount that you owe in taxes smaller. So it's kind of like a, a double win. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense in that capacity. So when we talk about how much you can contribute to a, a SEP IRA, you mentioned that that had different limits than maybe a 401k, or maybe it's stacked on top of one another. What does that practically look like? So the SEP IRA, you are limited to 25% of your self-employment income to a max of 58,000. Now, if we were to compare that with like a 401k from your employer or for a solo 401k, which you could open if you're self-employed too, that is, it's actually the same limit, but with the employee and the employer part combined. So as an employee, you can put 19,500 in your um, 401k. And then your employer match could bring you up to a maximum amount for the year of 58,000. Okay. So that 58,000 stays the limit. And with a SEP IRA, you just have to remember that you are an employee and the employer. And for this account, you are only the employer. So you just have to keep an eye on that limit of 58,000. But the 25% limit comes first. So you are only going to be maxing out your account at 58,000 if you're earning, I think, what, 232,000. So, yeah, let's let's yeah. break that down because yeah. you, you start uh, talking about several different things I want to unpack. And I think the first one there is let, let's go back to the, the gig economy example. Let's say somebody is driving for Uber. They're doing it every Saturday, every Sunday on top of a W-2 job, maybe. And let's say for round numbers, they make $10,000 in the, in the last year. And so based on the 25% rule, you're telling me that that person could contribute $2,500 into the SEP. Yes, correct. Okay, good place to start there. I'll just add in too that you should, and if you are deducting expenses for driving for Uber or anything else, it would be the amount after you deduct all of your expenses. Got it, that's a fantastic so Assuming you're not point. deducting anything and you just are you know, bringing home 10,000, then 2,500 would be ah, your limit. Gotcha, so net of expenses, that's an important caveat there. Yeah. And when you, when you talk about the 401k comparison for a minute there, uh, this video is dedicated really to people who are self-employed, but I think there's a really good nugget there. If you've got a W-2 income job, maybe there's an opportunity for you to touch base with your employer. If your 401k match isn't getting you to 58 grand, I know it's not for me. Maybe they can throw some extra in your, in your retirement bucket so that uh, just so that you know the rules there. I know a lot of companies are doing, you know, percentage matches. But that sounds like uh, there's a lot of money left on the table by a lot of employees every single year. There really is. And even just, you know, I know a lot of people kind of hesitate of putting the maximum amount in of 19500 because they are getting an employer match and they think that their employer match is counting towards that 19500 where it's not. It is an individual thing. You can put the full 19500 in and your employer matches don't count towards that. 
Gotcha. Makes makes a lot of sense once it's broken down and explained in, in basically ways that uh, it's probably never been explained to people before. So this is good. And why not? This stuff needs to be explained. That's one of my big pet peeves because this stuff is so important. It makes such a big difference in your future. Completely. But it's not explained. You're completely right. Completely agree. And that's why I throw them onto videos online for yeah. free for anyone who wants to check them out. Share it with your friends, folks. Absolutely. So, so to continue along this, this line, you, you started to talk about when you contribute to a SEP, you are basically putting your employer hat on, yeah. meaning you work for you, essentially, to, to think about it that way. But talk to me a little bit. What if, you're, what if you're actually a small business and you work for you, but maybe a couple other people work for you, too? Does that change the game any there? Absolutely. It really yeah. does. And now this is where you really kind of have to understand the rules that are set by, by the IRS to make sure that this is, you know, a good route for you. Okay. So when you have eligible employees that are working for you, you are required to open up a SEP IRA for them and then also match the contributions for them if you're doing it for yourself. So if you're putting 25% of your compensation into your SEP IRA, you are responsible for putting 25% of their compensation into their SEP IRA or whatever percentage that might be. Now, I'll go over what an eligible employee is. I think I have it off the top of my head, but you know, if you know viewers out there definitely double check with the IRS, but you need to have your employee needs to be at least 21. They need to have worked for you for 3 of the last 5 years and you need to have paid them at least $600 in compensation for that year. So that three out of the five years is kind of like a little bit of wiggle room. If you have employees, but you haven't had them that long, you could probably get away with opening one and funding it for yourself. But I would just be very cautious of staying up to date with where your employees are. And don't use that as a like, oh, you're gonna be eligible soon, so I don't want you as an employee anymore. <laughs> don't be like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. We don't want that to happen. But I think it's important to talk about that uh, in the sense that, you know, basically like a lot of other videos I've done, you, you're able to, to optimize things because you know the rules. And when you go in eyes wide open, you have a better understanding of what you can and cannot do. And so depending on whether you're an Uber driver or maybe you're delivering pizzas as a 1099 or you're actually working some sort of a small business where you have employees may change as you describe it whether or not it makes sense to open a SEP IRA as, a, as compared to, to different options you have. Because if you, uh, if you start to, to run the numbers and you realize that you're contributing uh, to all of your employees too, that can, can potentially change how you feel about it. Uh, but it's good to have that information up front and that's why I wanted to talk about it. So the, the next thing that comes to mind, and this is probably some of that gray area between having employees and having not, I know a lot of real estate brokerages work in, in clusters of teams and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And as best I understand it, those folks are independent contractors. And so I'm not going to hold you to it, but it sounds like that doesn't apply here because of the contractor status. Yep. No, if you have independent contractors working for you, they're not employees, they're not eligible employees. You, you could open a SEP for yourself and they could open SEP IRAs for themselves and they would be funding it versus you funding it for them. And that's, that's kind of what I thought there. So if you're, if you're working in a real estate capacity, a whole bunch of 1099s all working alongside one another, it sounds like every one of them down the line could do this for themselves and start to realize that benefit. Yes. Yeah. And so to, to really drive home one final thought is, you know, a, a decent uh, amount of, of my audience and your audience, too, is part of the financial independence community, trying to, to find ways to become financially independent. And a good mantra for that is to try to save as, as much as you can uh, toward these different buckets of retirement. And so it sounds to me like this is probably one of the strategies that doesn't get talked about a whole lot in the sense that this is a way to contribute more for retirement than you could have in any other capacity, just based on the fact that you have a, a side hustle. And frankly, a lot of people have side hustles. I'd say it's more common than, than maybe ever. Yeah, I would agree. It seems like a lot of people do, especially with, you know, we all have access to the internet now, and there are so many side hustles that you can just do at home online. And there's a lot more services available, like driving for Uber, doing Instacart deliveries, stuff like that, that hasn't really been around for that long. So I would definitely agree with that. 
Yeah, and, and that's why I really wanted to do this video is to, to contribute in the sense that, that the, the gig economy and people who are doing those sorts of jobs, they're underappreciated, in my opinion, in a lot of ways. And so if we can share the, the message a little bit that these people can be saving for retirement in ways that maybe they didn't know about it in the, the first place, uh, I think it's all the better. And so from, from that point of view, I want to thank you for joining me on the show and sharing a, sharing a little bit of that information. My and pleasure. Before I let you go, if you'd stay with me a little longer, I've got some rapid fire questions that I'd like to ask you known as the how-to cues. Are you up for that? Ooh, I'm nervous, but I'm ready. You can do it, I promise. So without further ado, question number one, what is the best book that you've read in the last 12 months? You know, um, probably Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I've been reading it for the last 12 months. It is a big book, but it's one of those books that just kind of stays with you. The characters just stay with you. And yeah, hands down, one of my favorites. All right, we'll put the, the title and the, the author's name down below so that uh, the people can check that out. Uh, tell me one podcast you subscribe to. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm not a big podcaster. That's something that, you know, I need some recommendations. Honestly, I bounce around between a few, but I'm not really consistent with the podcast. So I might have to pass on that one. Fantastic. We'll plug in Anthony Drew Gary on the how to show on the podcast Perfect. player of your choice, folks. Perfect. There we go. I, there's a given. I should have just said this one. <laughs> All right. What's one app on your phone you couldn't live without? Mm, probably Spotify for music. That's definitely important. And then I also have kind of like a guilty pleasure app design home where you just like design different rooms and stuff. And me and my mom always play it. And we kind of like share pictures of our rooms and our scores. And we're like, oh, you didn't get a good score. Oh, you got a really good score. So that's a fun one that I that I probably spend too much time on. That's fun. Everybody has their vices. Don't uh, don't be discouraged by it. All right. What's something that you've spent a hundred dollars or less on recently that's brought you immense value? Okay. Also something for my mom for Mother's Day. I got um, a beautiful piece of artwork commissioned by a local artist. It's just a nice drawing of my mom, my sister, and I that I plan on giving her for um, Mother's Day. And that was a hundred bucks. So. All right. Well, this video might drop before Mother's Day, but don't show it to mom. So yeah, exactly. she'll still be surprised. Right. <laughs> All right. The final question is, Alicia, where can people find out more about you? I have a YouTube channel myself, which is Alicia Dion, Friend of Finance. I also have a website, friendoffinance.com, which um, I would recommend going over to my compounding calculator. That's one of my favorite parts about my website. So you can kind of forecast what your investment growth potential is. So that's a fun one. Um, but yeah, mainly YouTube. You can find me there. I am on Instagram as well. Alicia, Friend of Finance. Fantastic. I will link to those in the notes down below. Alicia, thanks again for joining me on the How To Show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Anthony. It's been fun. Special thanks to Alicia for joining me on this episode of the show. And if you haven't done so before, check out her YouTube channel. You can find it in the show notes down below. But that's going to bring this episode of the show to a close. Hopefully there was something actionable in there that you can use in your own life. Or maybe you can share it with somebody else who might get benefit from it. And if you got any value from the episode, please hit the like button. Let YouTube, let the rest of the YouTube watchers know that this is a video worth checking out. And in the same vein, you can subscribe to the channel and you'll get notification bells if you hit it about new episodes that come out each and every Wednesday. And if you've got any feedback for this episode of the show or you want to interact with either me or Alicia, you can hit the comment section down below, leave uh, your thoughts there. And if you've got any ideas for future topics of the show, that's a good place to put those as well. If you know somebody who listens to podcasts instead of YouTube, you can link up with them as well. I am available on all of the podcast players that are available through Anchor. And so hitting Anthony Drew Gary or the How To Show on any podcast player will help you find me there. Until next week, this is Anthony Drew Gary, host of the How To Show, signing off.